aquatics is one of those things that can be very regional specific and it's kind of hard to avoid doing that. So I've, it, it, lots of the questions that are included and lots of the, the concepts I try to make universal and I try to make it so it's not specific so you have to learn something minute, right? If you kind of understand the vocabulary, you kind of understand the general idea, hopefully they can understand the question and find an answer or figure out an answer. So, you know, the first one being, um, and the main one, and, and this presentation will kind of work from a large scale down from there. So, um, first one being watershed. It's the basic concept of everything that we're dealing with here, right? That's an area contributing water to a pond, right? Surface runoff, spring, or stream fed. Um, you know, and, the, and it's not only a pond per se, right? It could be a river, a stream, um, so on and so forth like that. <clears throat> you know, kind of the idea being the rain falls on an area, where does that rain go? That's a watershed, right? Um, you can define it further. Um, you know, with rain falling in a specific basin, a specific site, that falls into a subwatershed, which then drains into a bigger watershed, which then drains into a river basin. So think locally, um, you know, for here, for example, rain falls in Grand Island, it enters into, uh, I'm trying to think, well, trying to think of a stream that's by, nearby, hits a local stream, that hits the Platte River. The Platte River drains into the Missouri River, Missouri River drains into the Mississippi River, drains into the Gulf Coast, right, as it falls down. So that's the general idea. What happens with that water within that river basin or within that um, watershed is important too. Um, and lots of, the, lots of the things and lots of the questions that'll hit technology. Let's see if we can make this work. I want a laser pointer. Okay. Um, you know, lots of those things deal with um, not only surface water, but groundwater in that exchange. You know, there's, there's times um, groundwater supplies water to the surface and vice versa. Sometimes they're not connected at all. Um, and I'm not going to ask you, and, and it would be impossible to be specific about that, but the general concept should be understood that, that there is an interchange between the two and it can go all ways. So, um, you know, and then along those lines too, you know, that everything that goes on within this landscape affects the water that's found within it. So, um, water budget's kind of important to understand, um, whether it be for a lake, a stream, um, or even groundwater, right? So you've got inflow plus precipitation plus runoff plus stream inflow on one side. On the other side, that's all the inputs. On the other side is all the outputs, right? Transpiration, evaporation, groundwater springs that would outflow to a surface water and stream, stream outflow as well, carrying it away. Um, probably the biggest point of all of this, as far as water quality goes, is point source understanding what point source and non-point source are. So point source pollution is easily as defined as if it's coming from a pipe, right? If you can identify specifically the spot where it's coming from, it's a point source pollution. So, you know, if I've got a hose and I'm draining, you know, whatever nasty pond I, or, you know, whatever nasty bucket I have, that's a point source pollution. Whatever's in there is a point source that's polluting the water. Um, factories, you know, sewage treatment, those all things are all point source pollutions. Um, as opposed to non-point point non -point source pollution, excuse me, um, you can't identify a specific point where that is introduced. Non-point source pollution is things like um, general runoff of fields, right? Um, general runoff of streets, 
golf courses, then all of those things are non-point source pollution. There's no one definitive place where it's coming from. The caveat to this is that, you know, if we drain tile a field, that all goes one spot, right? There's a pipe at the end of that field. Legally speaking, it is still a non-point source pollution. So that, you may, that, that question may come up on occasion, just as, just as a thinker, but um, anything else that comes out of a pipe is point source. Um, yeah, I think I covered this, urban areas, ag, all of that stuff is non-point source pollution. Um, then as we kind of barrel it down into a little more um, detail here, lodic systems, lodic rivers and streams, um, flowing water, lodic means flowing water, as opposed to lentic systems, which are lakes, ponds, things that are more standing. Um, stream ordering is important. The concept of it is fairly important. Um, basically, when you're ordering a stream, the order only goes up when two of the same number meet. So a one is a headwater, right, or a source. The very start, they're the smallest, um, have, the less have the least amount of water in them, least amount of flow. Um, you know, oftentimes, these are fairly easy to think about in the, in the aspect of a small mountain stream. Right, that's where they start. When two headwaters meet, they form a second order stream. When two second order streams meet, they form a third order stream. So as you get bigger and bigger, it becomes harder and harder to identify, and, but we'll try to keep it simple because the concept is what's important here. Um, there's also ephemeral streams, which are streams that uh, only run seasonally. Perennial streams that, that run all the time have water in them at all times. What uh, the ephemeral one? Uh, ephemeral runs seasonally. So maybe they only run in the spring when there's runoff, you know. The stream will still be there, but they just won't have any water in it. So all the time, yep. Um, And just this concept, I, I don't think the details are important. I think that understanding the concept is, because you can kind of piece together the details after understanding the concept. But the river continuum concept is, is the thought that <clears throat> the higher order stream you get, the different the biology within that stream is. And that only makes sense from the regard that like a mountain stream or a headwater stream with very low flow, very low volume, going to be considerably different than what you find in the Missouri River or the Mississippi River, right? Um, and, and the creatures that you find within them are different because A, the amount of nutrients and the type of foods that are in those small water streams are just, they're different. Um, so, you know, the, the concept being that as you move up in orders, you're also going to move up in the size and the dynamic of the food chain. <clears throat> uh, yeah, sort of another picture combining that ordering. How do I do this here? That ordering with yeah, where to go? Sorry, there we go. Um, the stream ordering with that concept, right? So you'll have you know, the, the biology within this headwater stream is gonna be things that are more adept at taking care of leaves and, and uh, bigger items. You know, the macroinvertebrates within there are gonna be shredders and grazers and things that eat larger, um, larger pieces of organic matter. Consequently, the fish in that are gonna be mainly preying on these types of, of uh, macroinvertebrates. And as you move downstream, when that stuff's all broken down, the organic matter you're finding is much finer. So you, you have a different set of macroinvertebrates and your food chain is bigger. So you're gonna end up with larger fish, um, larger and different types of fish within those. So that's just basically the concept of it. Again, the details aren't necessarily important. It's understanding how it works. Um, moving on to lakes, lake ecology. Um, it moves 
horizontally and vertically. Uh, the littoral zone is that area within a lake where plants can grow. There's still enough sunlight penetration to hit the bottom of the lake where you will get plant growth. Um, the limnetic zone is that open water area. Not a lot of plant growth. Uh, it's considerably deeper, you know. Um, and then throwing in that, the photic zone, usually when you move out of the photic zone is when you start losing that plant growth. The photic zone is that depth that sunlight can penetrate and help things grow. Bottom of a lake is called the benthic zone. That's where sediment is deposited. Um, yeah, that's not a very good slide. Um, <laughs> you know, and then you and then you add to all of that knowledge the the food web, right? So you've got these small critters that are uh, living on organic matter along the bottom. That organic matter on the bottom is important to invertebrates, macroinvertebrates, so on and so forth. Fish dine on those, bigger fish dine on those, so on and so forth. Fairly, fairly simple, you know, standard food web, if you will, right? Um, the idea that most of this organic matter within the bottom of this lake comes from outside of the lake itself, right? It's deposited either through a stream coming into it, a river coming into it, or from trees and organic matter that are outside of the lake. So we have different lake types. Um, I'll just hit those really quick. Seepage lake, it's a natural lake. The water source is from the groundwater or precipitation. Um, it has very limited and a very small watershed, right? Um, its watershed is only so far as the rain will run into it. Um, oftentimes that could be a matter of feet. Um, all of the all of the exchange of water going in and out basically comes from the groundwater. These are very common in Nebraska in the Sandhills. Um, groundwater drainage lake. Uh, basically, there is a water source. Um, it is a natural lake, but there is so much water either coming through the groundwater or the watershed that it has a stream that leads off. So this could be a headwater type of lake. Drainage lake, um, same, same sort of concept, natural lake, um, streams coming in, groundwater coming in, precipitation, heavy runoff, and has a stream outlet as well. So there's an in and an out on the surface, as well as groundwater. Um, an impoundment, which is probably the most common you'll find in Nebraska, probably the most common you'll find in the Midwest. Um, it's just a reservoir, right? They dam a stream make a lake. So. Sand pit lakes are man-made, very similar to uh, groundwater fed lakes, except that we went and dug them out. In Nebraska, they were created to make roads. That's why they're all along the interstate and all along the major highways, <clears throat> usually by sand and gravel bottom. Almost all groundwater fed. And the Oxbow Lake. Um, you ever been to Carter Lake, Iowa? That is an oxbow lake. Missouri River used to flow around it. Um, the natural process of a river is that it deposits material on the inside of a bend. As water, as flows rise and fall, so doesn't that deposition. Eventually it deposits so high it can't get over it anymore and you're left with a lake. And then you have a little tiny town in the middle and weird border laws. So, <laughs> but that is Carter Lake. And there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them, particularly along the um, Missouri River, um, the Loop River. Now the Platte has a, a couple, but they're a little different. Um, these classifications do sort of vary, but basically um, the general thought is, is a you know, an ornamental pond is something that's, that's designed and built very, very, very small. Um, ponds are usually what more along the lines of what you think is a farm pond, right? Um, maybe created to provide a water source for cattle. Um, lakes are greater than 15 acres and are natural. That is an important distinction to make. Um, reservoirs are man-made. 
right? Calculating volume is very important when it comes to lakes. Um, usually, a lot of it can be done visually, um, but it's the area times the depth, really. So calculating your surface area and then uh, calculating depth with multiple depth measurements along the lake, um, you can usually figure out a volume. That volume is usually described in acre feet. An acre foot is defined as the amount of water it takes to cover one acre one foot deep. Acre feet, kind of right in the name. Um, deep lakes, there's stratification. In shallow lakes, there's continual cycling. Why does this matter? Um, we'll kind of hit that in a little bit. But, but um, stratification, when a lake turns over or when it's stratified, um, deals with the amount of nutrients that are available to that lake, and we'll kind of come to that. Um, but thermal stratification is a very important word to know. Um, basically, a, a lake that's deep enough will have multiple ranges of water temperature within its depth. <clears throat> if you go swimming at a sand pit, you walk so far deep, your chest is pretty warm and your toes are frozen. Um, water is heavier the colder it is, so that cold water sinks to the bottom, warmer water rises to the top, and that actually will separate itself within a lake. Um, that band in the middle is the metalimnon, the epilimnon is the top. Sometimes in Nebraska, that warm part is only this deep. Um, um, it, uh, it, there, there's a lot of factors that go into that, but it is important because that bottom section, this hypolimnion, oftentimes is devoid of oxygen. So oftentimes you will not have fish or anything that are able to spend much time down there um, because most of the growing and most of the life goes up on here where there's sunlight, so. <clears throat> is that true for the ocean too? Yeah, to a degree. The ocean has a lot of different sources than, than a lake does. Um, on the whole, probably not. Um, plus, and we can back up here and actually hit it. So, so the difference being when you have a deep lake, it does stratify, right? Because you're only getting, uh, wind plays a big part in a lake's life, right? Um, it can stir it up and keep that top cycled. Um, the shallower the lake, the less likely you are to develop that stratification because the wind is going to keep it mixed up. Um, and, and oceans have obviously big currents and other things that are at play there to keep things moving. <clears throat> so how does it work um, in the winter? Well, you need sunlight. Things will still grow, but you need sunlight to keep oxygen moving. Um, a lake will overturn. Um, in the spring and in the fall when those temperatures at the top shift, right? Um, as you reach the fall and that, that water at the surface, the outside, the ambient temperature becomes cold enough that it cools this water colder than what's at the bottom. That lake will literally in a matter of days flip completely over and it'll bring all the nutrients that were on the bottom up with it. Um, and same thing in the, in the summer, it'll flip back, or you know, in the, in the spring, it'll flip back. Um, pretty important as far as growth in life goes within a lake. <clears throat> so we'll, de we'll just touch on some water quality things here. Um, Nebraska and in a lot of Midwestern reservoirs, reservoirs, sediment is the number one pollutant. Um, most everything you see as far as um, ag best management practices and uh, things that you're putting in such as uh, terracene and, and buffer strips and all those things are, are intended to keep the soil where it belongs. Because if you don't, you end up filling in your reservoirs. Um, all reservoirs have a limited lifetime. Most of them are 50 or 60 years um, before the amount of sediment that comes down the stream, lands in the reservoir, and stops it, and, and uh, it'll eventually just become a wetland. And this actually happens to all lakes. Um, it just happens much faster with reservoirs because they have a much larger watershed. It's not natural. 
a natural lake will eventually fill in with enough organic matter and everything else coming into a lake, you know, where it, a reservoir is maybe 50 or 60 years, a natural lake could last 100 or 200 years. Um, but they eventually will all fill in if something isn't done. So sediment is the number one pollutant um, in Nebraska. And for like a lot of reasons, uh, bank sloughing is a big one. Um, but the biggest problem truly is that external um, source of sediment coming in off of the fields. Um, how do we measure that sort of thing? Boy, this slide is not good, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jeez, that's why I could never be a teacher. Um, <clears throat> turbidity, turbidity is a measure of water clarity, right? Um, we use for that a secchi disc is, is the cheapest and easiest way to do it. It's not the most specific or scientific because it's user dependent. Um, but basically you take a black and white disc, attach it to a tape measure or a rope, drop it down until you can't see it anymore. At that point you measure it, you pull it back up till you can see it and you measure that and then you half the two measurements and that is your secchi disc reading. Um, it's not a great measure to use when you're comparing lakes, it's a great measure to use when you're comparing the same lake to its own data. Um, because there's a lot of components that go into not being able to see into the water. It could be dirt, it could be organic matter, it just could be the type of water. Um, so it's, it's a very cheap and very easy way to measure turbidity. Um, and it is very common. So if you wanna get really scientific and spend money, you can use meters that will, that will do that for you too. Um, and that, th those measures then you can use to compare with other water bodies. So the, the Secchi disc is, is good. Are you still doing this at the state contest, having the kids do this? I, I haven't yet, but I have had it out on display as an, to identify. Um, it, it's a little challenging to do it a contest, to actually do it, because you have to be out on the water. Um, I mean, you could simulate it, I suppose. Um, I have had it out just as a question to what is this, you know, or what, what does this do? Um, I think at Halsey one time the kids had to do it and they were given a little leeway. Sure. You know, it was off like a dock and there would be stuff and that, that would go out with them and just... And that, if we could have a dock or something, that would be ideal. Um, I think the three state tests I've done, I don't know if we've had a site where it would work at all. Um, uh, the NCF level, sometimes they have a modified, and I don't know if this is used or not, it's like a graduated cylinder with a secchi disc okay. on the bottom, and you just fill it up. And, and look down. down. And I don't know if that's scientific yeah. or people actually use it that way. But. I think, you know, I, and like I said with all this stuff, like just knowing the concept, right? I mean, knowing how to take the measurement, I, I mean, we could send anybody out to, to do that as long as, you know, it's not, there's nothing super complicated about it. Um, just kind of understanding how to do it. So, um, you know, and that, that does bring up the bigger question of, of finding hands-on things to do. And it is tough with this subject because so much of it is done out in the water. Um, so if anybody's got ideas, gosh, I'd love to hear them. It'd be great. Because <laughs> I struggle. I, I, it's, I haven't figured out how to do it in a good manner yet. So, um, The other biggest pollutant that is associated very closely with sediment is bacteria. Um, we are a state that, that relies on agriculture. Um, and with that comes cattle and livestock and with that becomes E. coli. Um, cities and, and villages are also as, as much to blame as anything too. So um, E. coli is found in the waste products of all warm-blooded animals. Right? Um, septic systems, non-functioning or, or malfunctioning septic systems, waterfowl and livestock runoff are all very big sources of, of E. coli that find their way into the water. Why is it associated with sediment? Because usually when you've got runoff, you have sediment as well as E. coli. I mean, the waste product usually ends up on the ground. So you're usually uh, washing it in with, um, 
with the rain or with the runoff. Um, in addition, E. coli is very susceptible to sunlight. As soon as sunlight hits it, it, it doesn't survive very well. So if you've got a lake or a stream that is, has a lot of runoff, is very murky and very dark and cloudy, E. coli will thrive because it's not getting the sunlight that will kill it. So <clears throat> usually where you have one sediment issue, you've got E. coli as well. Um, health concerns, I think we all know what E. coli will do to us, but the big one is gastroenteritis, flu-like symptoms. Um, you know, other contaminants that we look at, um, pesticides, nutrients, um, heavy metals. Atrazine being the most common pesticide out there used. Um, it's one of the more persistent ones. Um, if we were ordering contaminants, nitrogen and phosphorus are both very high on that list as well, as far as um, issues within the Midwest. Um, lead's a big one, but mercury's bigger. Um, it's, it is important to understand how mercury finds its way into our environment. Um, the biggest and most common source is coal-fired power plants. Trace amounts of mercury within coal that's burned um, leave the stack, it rises up into the atmosphere. Let's see if I can use this fancy pointer again. Um, rise, it, it's burned, rises up in the atmosphere, rain picks it up, drops it into a wetland, or drops it into the bottom of the lake where it undergoes transformation of methylmercury. <laughs> when it becomes methylmercury, it is able to be uptaken biologically. So. You know, these little critters in the bottom are eating their food that's contaminated with uh, mercury, with methylmercury. These fish eat the little creatures. Um, at each step up the food chain, that becomes magnified more and more. So um, this guy in the bottom only eats one molecule of mercury. This guy needs to eat 10 of these little guys for a meal, so now he's got 10 molecules of mercury. This guy needs 10 of these, so now you're at 100, so on and so forth. It, um, and it doesn't go anywhere, right? It just keeps cycling through the system. So, um, the big, the big um, contaminant, uh, the big contaminants that cause the, the largest problems probably are nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, the Gulf of Mexico hypoxia issue, you know, the, the quote unquote dead zone or Red Sea that, that appears every year in the Gulf of Mexico is caused by too much <laughs> nitrogen and phosphorus. Usually phosphorus is the main driver, but um, you know, they both have some somewhat equal sources, right? Nitrogen is fairly naturally occurring, um, but runoff, whether it be from your lawn, the golf course, or you know, some sort of agricultural field, finds its way into the stream, um, then finds its way into a lake or reservoir, or the Gulf of Mexico, um, and it drives all sorts of uh, green things to grow. You know, a little bit is good, a lot is terribly bad. So um, other sources are waterfowl, um, malfunctioning septic systems again, or insufficient treatment facilities. And, you know, less common, but it's actually weirdly still happens is illegal dumping of ammonia. Ammonia is nitrogen. Um, we still have it, and every few years we'll get it in Nebraska. Um, the other big source is phosphorus. Of course, that uh, is a big one with fertilizer. Um, most detergents now are going phosphorus-free because of this issue, so it's pretty hard to find them now, but, but for a long time, you know, your, your dish soap and your laundry soap all had phosphorus in to help it clean. Um, and go anywhere except out the pipe, down the treatment facility, down the stream, and then uh, ended up in the Gulf of Mexico. So <clears throat> why it matters, why these things are bad, well, like I said, they cause things to grow. Um, exactly like your lawn, you know, when you want your lawn to green up, you lay down nitrogen and phosphorus, it greens up. You put enough in a lake, it'll green up. Um, as you get too much algae, um, those things will overtake the whole ecosystem and they, they, they prevent other things from growing. Then you throw in the whole respiration um, cycle or oxygen cycle. These things will use up, you know, during the day they're producing oxygen. At night they're using oxygen. 
Um, if you get too much and they're using too much oxygen, they will use it all up at, and during the night when none's being introduced and every other living thing in that lake will die. And that is sort of what happens in the Gulf of Mexico, right? They're using up all the oxygen within the Gulf. There's none available for any fish or any other creatures. So um, not a great situation to be in. And then you throw on the blue-green algae, which I will touch on here for a second. But um, elevated nutrients, the term you're looking for, and I'm sure we'll be on a test somewhere, is eutrophication. You know, it's defined by excess, excessive or extensive macrophytic growth, which is green growth, um, and algal blooms. Um, Blue-green algae, cyanobacteria, also known as harmful algal blooms, um, are those things that uh, have made the news in Lake Erie, because Lake Erie is a drinking source for towns such as Cleveland and, uh, ah, drawing a blank, but a um, number of those larger cities use Lake Erie as a drinking water source. Every summer, they'll have a harmful algal bloom issue because like all the lakes um, in the Midwest and, and Florida also has this problem. Florida's been under this problem um, all summer. They were in the news. Too many nutrients in the water. They end up with these cyanobacterial blooms. Those cyanobacterial um, cells produce toxin. Uh, microcystin is a uh, hepatotoxin, liver toxin, if you drink enough of it. Your liver doesn't fare well, and um, you don't, uh, you're not around for much longer. Um, Anatoxin A is another, another one very similar. Um, it affects your liver, your kidneys, everything else. Um, those BMAA and DABA, if there's uh, any chemistry teachers in the room, can help me pronounce those long chain um, amino acids. But... They're suspected in causing neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, all the, all the ones that nobody wants to get. They're horrible. Um, as a matter of fact, downwind of Lake Erie, there's a really high occurrence of those neurodegenerative diseases, with the suspected cause being those two toxins there. So. Farmers who would be like seventy-five, seventy to seventy-five to eighty, right now, that have high occurrences of Parkinson's. That's it's a good, very, very good question, actually. And two months ago, I would have said, bah, I don't know what you're talking about. But I actually met. I, I gave a presentation on harmful algal blooms to a, a health group in Nebraska. Um, lots of us that are involved in public health for when we all meet a couple times a year. And the state health director afterwards had brought that particular subject up. And that is something they want to investigate because apparently Nebraska in general has a very high rate of Parkinson's um, compared to the national average. So, and it's like certain age groups. And now they're <coughs> trying to pin it on just pesticides right. and chemicals used. Because like, for example, my grandfather-in-law died of Parkinson's last year. He was on the UNL livestock judging team. Of the 20 people he was on the team with, 18 of them were farmers that got Parkinson's. That is an insanely high number. Wow. Um, I would suspect that the state health office is going to add this as a, as a question, you know, um, because they have that data of those people that have Parkinson's. So then they can do a study and say, okay, where do you guys spend your time? What you know, what do you have, where do you vacation, what do you do, and, and try to determine if there's a pattern of habits or things like that. And a lot of these farm ponds have this issue, right? Um, because they're, it's a function for them, right? They don't necessarily care that it's, you know, not swimmable. They use it to feed cattle or, or whatever. Well, you, think about that, you put that in your tanks that you're going to mm -hmm. with, and oh, mm -hmm. I stuff on my arms, I'm gonna spray it off. Or yep. And this stuff, you know, the thought being that these two particularly um, become very dangerous when they're aerosolized, right? So if you're irrigating with it or, you know, whatever, however means that it finds its way into the air. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm not a doctor, a medical doctor, you know, um, so I don't know. But that has, that question has been brought to me um, regarding that because that stuff is pretty nasty. And they are looking at it downwind of Lake Erie, like I said, because so many 
they're, they're such a high rate um, of those issues there, and that makes sense. I mean, Lake Erie's huge. There's a lot of wind in that direction, um, and it has been a, a question in Nebraska. So it's pretty nasty stuff, um, and currently there's not a real way, there's not a short-term solution to the problem, right? Improved ag practices help. Well, we still don't know the long-term effects of some of it. Right. That this, you know, um, cyanobacteria has been around since the beginning of, of the world, right? The, the theory, the, the current theory is, is that cyanobacteria is responsible for oxygenating the world. Mm -hmm. um, it had, you know, through various evolutionary processes, learned um, or adapted with other cells to photosynthesize. Um, it's more bacteria than it is not bacteria. Um, you know, it doesn't have a cell wall and things like that, but it photosynthesizes. So that's the thought process is that because of cyanobacteria, it oxygenated the atmosphere. So, I mean, it's been around longer than anything, um, and it is very good at evolving, you know. What, and it's always, it's never, it hasn't become an extensive problem until we started doing the things that we do, right? Um, and so now that we understand that it exists and what it does, um, you know, we've only been looking at it for 20 years now, so there's a lot of research to go to understand it. So, I could talk for a few hours on that subject alone, so I'll try to move on here. Um, that is what I do for most of my days, actually, is, is that particular subject. So, um, trophic state index is important to know, right? So this is a measure to understand the health of a lake just using a few quick parameters. One is the secchi disc, one is the phosphorus concentration, and the other one is the chlorophyll A concentration. Um, you can use those three numbers, combine them, to give you a range of numbers that will tell you how your lake is. So we learned eutrophic here on the last slide. Oligotrophic means there's probably not enough nutrients in that lake to be a super productive lake. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Mesotrophic is kind of that middle ground. Eutrophic, you're starting to run into problems. Too many nutrients, it becomes too green. And hypereutrophic, which Nebraska finds a lot of its lakes and reservoirs, um, has too many. So. Um, now, hey, look, I just talked about that. All right, we'll skip that slide. <laughs> It's like the first time I've seen this. Um, you know, the other topic to hit would be species diversity. Um, and I, I think maybe not the first time you've heard this sort of concept today. Um, but there, there's two things to look at, species richness and species evenness, right? Um, having a lake that has 10,000 carp in it versus a lake that has 400 total fish, but 25 different species, right? So it doesn't have as many fish, but it has a whole lot more. That lake with the more fish is, is far and away a better ecological situation to have than just to have a lake with a lot of one species, right? So that's what this diversity index sort of addresses. Um, by taking, you know, various species and their numbers, <clears throat> right? So um, you want something that's somewhat even along um, as well as having a large number of them, if that makes sense. A, a lot of different species with an even number of each. That's, that's, what, the, that's what the diversity index has tried to address. Um, there's different ways to calculate it. I don't know if I would ever ask a team to calculate that, but understanding what it is, or at least understanding the results Right, understanding the concept of, of diversity and its importance is, is good. Um, matter of fact, I don't ever, I, I do use diversity indexes, but there's calculators online. You just put everything in and it just gives you the number. So just understanding what, what the concept is is important. Um, so that's, that, those diversity indexes can be used for anything, right? Fish, um, plants, you name it. Um, one that's a little more specific to water and streams is the EPT index, and that deals with three um, families of macroinvertebrates. The ephemeropteras, the plecopteras, and the trichopteras. 
Um, those three um, families are usually indicative of a very healthy water or a clean water. So using those three and figuring out the percentage of their abundance is, is usually a very good measure of a quality water or a quality stream. So it's a fairly common way um, to do an assessment of a, of a water. And this one I think is important. Um, I think one of the things I've noticed with teams that are testing, they may know how to use a key to identify a species. They may not, most of them don't use it. So stress to them to A, learn how to use a key and B, to use it. Um, I, if, if we have a, if we're asking them to identify a fish, a key will be provided to them um, that has the answer in it. So if they can figure out how to use a key, um, which, you know, oftentimes it's a book that has all of the answers in it, right? The part, the name of the parts they're looking for, pictures of the parts they're looking for, and how to get to the, the actual species of fish. So um, if they want to practice, there's some very good books out there. Fish of Nebraska um, is one that's very new and very recent. I think um, the Nebraska chapter of the AFS tried to buy a book for every public library in Nebraska. I, um, everyone should have access to it. If you don't have access to one, let me know. We'll see what we can do to get you access to one. But check your library, either your school library or your uh, county library. Um, that book should exist. Um, they're not that expensive if you have the funds to buy one too. They're 60, 70 bucks. Um, but, but that is a very good book um, and, and a good one to practice. There's also lots of online stuff as well. So um, with that, here we are, my gratuitous large fish picture. <laughs> <clears throat> that is a paddlefish. Oh. Yep, at the time I was working on the pallet sturgeon project though. So <laughs> it is what we were looking for, but that is a paddlefish, yes.